Hi, everyone. Really excited to be at this workshop. And today, uh, my student, uh, Quan Fan, and I will share with you some of our recent work. Let me start by sharing our slides. So the talk we're going to give is called Creating Diverse Tasks to Catalyze Robotic Learning. Um, let me begin by acknowledging some of the students and collaborators that our work will, uh, who has contributed to the work that we, we're going to present. Most importantly, uh, I'll start by um, uh, talking about our work in the ha uh, first half of this talk. And then uh, my PhD student jointly advised by Silvio Savaresi, Quan Fang will take over from, from uh, uh, the second half of the talk. So here's the um, outline of our talk today. We'll talk about uh, the importance of data that has catalyzed the AI boom, but then we'll focus on robotic learning and how we can uh, uh, rely on simulation tasks to create more data that is important for training. And finally, we'll talk about a new way of thinking of not generating data, but generating tasks for robotic learning. Okay, well, to start with, we'll give a historical view on the role of data. Here's a quote that uh, I really uh, like. Data sets, not algorithms, might be the key limiting factor to develop human level artificial intelligence. And as we can see, that the world of data is now awash and has contributed to the major progress in AI. In fact, if you dial the clock back uh, 20 years ago, uh, there has been already a lot of data set efforts in the field of computer vision that has seeded some of the most important research in the pre-deep learning era, such as segmentation data sets, face data sets, digital data sets, uh, human action data sets, and more. As any of us who come from machine, who are students of machine learning would know that model fitting data um, have a, uh, interact with each other and uh, uh, give rise to results and, and models that can neither generalize well or fall into overfitting situations or, or underfitting situations. So when we look at how uh, models learn, we start to look at the capacity of the model and its performance. And in many cases, when data is not enough, the model starts, uh, especially models with enough parameters, start to overfit the data, but with poor generalization capability. So about uh, 15 years ago, uh, the, 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 the field of computer vision and, and machine learning in general start to take a shift in terms of the way we think about um, model uh, development. Uh, we start to um, not only look at how parameters can be designed, but really how data can drive uh, uh, machine learning models. And this is also concurrent with the important development in the world, which is the internet data growth. Um, for many of us who still remember the early days of internet, there is about 10, 20 years that between the last uh, decade of last century and the first decade of this century, where there was just explosive data growth. And this has also impacted deeply our, our research in computer vision and uh, uh, in AI in general. Especially in computer vision, there has been heroic effort um, in uh, uh, building data sets, large scale data sets that can impact and uh, research problems. Um, two of my favorite data sets are MIT's Label Me data set and UCLA's uh, Lotus Hill data set. They actually are so ahead of their time and, and spend incredible amount of uh, effort to give detailed labels of what happens in an image in order for uh, training machine learning models that uh, can do the, the various kind of tasks such as image segmentation and object recognition. 
in my group, my student and I took a little bit of a different view. We, um, we have identified uh, along with a lot of work in, in our field that object categorization is the most important North Star at the time uh, for computer vision. So instead of giving detailed labels of images, we went for scale and created an image net that has a um, um, order or two magnitude uh, more images and labels compared to any concurrent data set or con con uh, contemporary data set at the time. So that was the onset of um, ImageNet. And the motivation here, again, is to really um, endow the machine learning models with enough data so that we can train high capacity models uh, with a lot of parameters to capture the variability of objects and, and diverse objects in this world. And uh, what we know is the combination of neural network models, especially convolutional neural network models, um, uh, powerful chips with parallel computing capability like GPUs and ImageNet set off a new era. And uh, since then, uh, data sets uh, have been created in different uh, areas of research that uh, follows the spirit of ImageNet. And we've seen a lot of fun data sets from ShapeNet, MusicNet, SpaceNet, Medical ImageNet, EventNet, ActivityNet, and, and beyond. So, um, so what is next? A lot of my colleagues asked me, you know, is there a data net, uh, image net for uh, one of the most uh, exciting area of research, in my opinion, which is robotic learning. Uh, in fact, several of my robotic colleagues at Stanford have often talked about uh, the concept of image net for robotics and how that can contribute to uh, RL training, uh, policy learning, and, and planning. So of course, uh, when we think about robotic learning, it's very different from perception. And there are some challenges in obtaining data for robotic learning. First of, first of all, uh, robotic agents are embodied. They, um, you cannot just feed them pixels. There is an actuation uh, part of the system that is really important. And this, uh, this body, um, interacts with the world. And uh, in fact, um, the interaction is extremely diverse. So that poses a lot of challenges in collecting data from robots. But nevertheless, there has been great work in the past um, few years in generating much larger scale robotic data and including arm farms and other uh, various uh, efforts. Um, I think this line of work is going to continue and it's going to be very exciting, uh, but there are still issues. First of all, um, it just takes a lot of resource. If you have a big company uh, with a lot of money, this is still um, a viable uh, route. But uh, not everybody can have and afford that resource. But more importantly, um, as we consider the kind of robotic tasks that we want to, we want to, uh, you know, in enable our uh, AI algorithm and system to do. Many of them are more long horizon, are complex planning tasks, and uh, as we our ambition towards these tasks grow, it becomes more and more uh, difficult to collect a large amount of real world robotic data. So what can we do? Well, um, luckily uh, simulation technology has uh, improved greatly and a lot of the researchers uh, turned into simulation as an alternative um, um, route to create more robotic training data. And there's some real advantage in, uh, in simulation environments. It, it, it is much faster in speed. It can scale infinitely. Uh, it is highly reproducible. It's also very safe to conduct uh, um, experiments. And the cost is a lot lower, orders of magnitude lower than uh, real physical robots. 
And uh, in the short few years, a couple of years really, uh, recently we have seen a flurry of wonderful uh, efforts in simulated environments for robotic learning. And a lot of them are, um, are really making important progress. So part of our work uh, in, in our group, uh, in Stanford uh, Vision and Learning Group, is also to consider how we catalyze robotic learning by designing simulated tasks in simulation environments. And uh, uh, at Stanford, we created this simulation um, environment called iGibson. Uh, it's an interactive environment of uh, large scale, uh, scale virtual, um, uh, virtualized uh, uh, interactive simulation for robotic learning. And this is an ongoing effort of a fairly large team of, of students and researchers. Um, one side note that I think is important for me at least is why the name Gibson. Well, Gibson is a um, pioneering psychologist who has uh, discussed the importance of intelligence and perception in, in, in the interaction with the world. He says that ask not what's inside your head, but what your head is inside of. And I really do firmly believe that uh, one of the most exciting uh, horizon um, in AI research is to figure out how do we design learning principles for agents to learn to interact uh, with the world. So, so that's a tribute to, to Gibson and, and I Gibson stands for interactive Gibson. Um, I Gibson has a number of features that I wanna share with you today. Um, they are, um, I list the five features that I, I will get into the details of. The first feature is it is a repository of large scale scenes. Uh, in fact, the most important part of this is that uh, we have 15 large scale realistic scenes coming from the real world uh, scanned um, um, into the simulated environment so that uh, they, they really reflect the kind of real world uh, in, uh, ecological environment, uh, object distributions and, and, and scales. And this is important to us as we follow the philosophy of Gibson and really respect what the real world is. So it's uh, these uh, 15 scenes are really large 3D uh, interactive scenes and, and, and are uh, each of them is the size of our apartment unit or, or, or similar, um, similar sizes. Here's just uh, to show you some videos of examples of what this environment uh, is, is like. And also to, to note that our objects are also annotated with material information, including surface properties like albedo, metallic, or roughness. Uh, the second thing that's important for us is that uh, the scenes are fully interactive. You can apply forces to these objects, in, including articulated objects. Your agent can move around and uh, uh, push uh, objects, open doors and drawers, open windows, and, and other kind of interactions. And this is important uh, if we want to um, design tasks to, to do robotic learning. And this uh, differentiates us from some of the other environment where the scene itself is rather static and uh, the actions are uh, mostly predefined commands. Um, another thing that uh, we uh, have designed into iGibson to increase the uh, diversity and variability of our environment is domain randomization. So um, we have, um, um, the capability to randomize materials on our objects, including textures and physical properties like friction, um, and also the 3D models of the object. But we do conserve the realistic layout size and distribution of objects uh, to make it as realistic as possible. And this gives uh, the, the potential of um, an unlimited um, or, or very large number of variations of our scenes. 
And uh, another property of I. Gibson is that it generates a large variety of high quality visual sensor signals. Uh, the, 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 uh, is, uh, uh, includes RGB, uh, physics-based renderer, depth signal, segmentation, surface normals, and, and LIDAR. And these signals can be used uh, down, downstream when we train agents to, to plan and, and solve tasks. Last but not least, we strive to make uh, iGibson uh, interface very user-friendly. Of course, this environment is designed for virtual agents, um, but it's important that uh, we also enable human demos. So we have um, enabled a relatively uh, you, uh, easy to use mouse and keyboard command to navigate and, and interact with all elements in the scene. But we're also uh, developing uh, VR capabilities for iGibson so that uh, um, human subject can feel even more uh, immersed and realistic when um, we're interacting with these, uh, with these things. Um, so in summary, uh, this is a fairly large table to show you that iGibson is a contemporary um, um, simulation environment for robotic interaction, along with a large number of wonderful efforts and, and, and really very uh, good uh, uh, simulation environments, including Habitat, Sapien, AI Tutor, Virtual Home, TDW, and, and more. And uh, we're releasing an archive paper that uh, will, will detail the, the strengths and weaknesses of different uh, environments and, and how I, Gibson can be used in certain in certain ways. So I won't belabor this table, um, and, but hopefully uh, this would be a, a useful comparison for everybody. So let me just remind everybody, the goal here is that with large scale simulation environment, we open up robotic learning in, uh, with uh, a possibility of learning from a large amount of data in these simulations. But there is a caveat I have um, kind of uh, brushed under the rug, which is that we still have to design tasks by hand, right? Um, the, the, the environment itself doesn't just automatically give you robotic interaction tasks. And that is still a very expensive process. It's probably necessary and that's, uh, and these environments have, can make it a lot easier than the physical robots. But, what about a different way of thinking? And that's the, the, the third part of this talk that I want to touch on. Um, and I will invite Kwon to present this part of his, his work, which is to, um, instead of designing and generating a task environment, we actually automatically gener uh, generate tasks. And, and this gets us into uh, the, the spirit of meta-learning and we can use that to cat uh, catalyze robotic learning. At this point, I'm going to turn this presentation to Quan. Hi, everyone. I'm Quan Fang from Stanford Vision and Learning Lab. As we know, recent advances in deep generative models have enabled us to learn to generate various formats of data of realistic details, including images, shapes, and languages. In this work, we ask the question, can we follow this line of thought and learn to generate tasks? Recently, an increasing number of work have been proposed to automatically create game levels in grid world domains. Most of these works focus on maximizing the diversity. In contrast, we aim to create suitable tasks that can expedite learning to solve certain target tasks of interest. There have also been many inspiring curriculum learning algorithms that generate goals or environment layouts. Instead of focusing on a single aspect of the task, we would like to generate highly configurable tasks of rich variations. Consider robotic manipulation tasks in this cluttered tabletop environment. The goal of this task is to push the blue soda can as the target object into the goal indicated by the sign circle. A positive reward can be only achieved uh, after the target object enters the circle. 
in the presence of obstacles and the complex table surface, the task can easily fail due to collisions or object falling off the table. To complete uh, such a task, the robot needs to strategically push around the target object and obstacles to make way for each other. A reinforcement learning algorithm can often suffer in such tasks due to challenges including sparse rewards, large state and action space, and the stringent uh, environment constraints. Although this target task is hard to learn from scratch, there usually exist many similar tasks that are easier to solve. This task could be of different difficulties resulting from the variations uh, of uh, environment layouts, object properties, arrangements, and uh, reward functions. If we can define these variations using the task parameter w, then we can create a parameterized task space that contains configurable initial state probability, dynamics, and the reward functions. In this way, each task can be represented by a unique W sampled from the task parameter space. However, if we uniformly sample tasks from the, uh, such a highly configurable task space, as shown by these examples on the slide, most such tasks would be either infeasible or trivially easy. Therefore, our goal is to capture the generated tasks using a learnable distribution of W. Given the target task, we would like the generated tasks to start with the easiest scenarios and gradually adapt across a parameterized task space towards the target task as a policy learns to solve harder and harder tasks. To this end, we propose aptgen, an approach for progressively generating tasks to expedite reinforcement learning in hard exploration problems. At the heart of our approach, a task generator learns to create new tasks via a black box procedural generation module by adaptively sampling from the parameterized task space. The policy learns from trajectories collected from both the target task and the generated tasks during training. A task discriminator learns to estimate the similarity between the two task sources based on the collected trajectories. Our key insight is that the learning progress can be jointly defined by how similar the generated tasks are to the target task and how well the policy can solve the generated tasks at hand. In this way, Aptgen learns to progressively adapt the generated tasks towards the target task by balancing the uh, task similarity and the reward achieved in the generated tasks. Here is an example of the progression of the generated tasks given the target task. At the beginning of training, the table surface is mostly flat. As the policy learns to solve such easy scenarios, the table surface starts to morph by forming the bridge and the slot as appeared in the target task. The original goal has a large radius, which makes it easy to reach. Then the goal gradually shrinks and the success condition becomes more rigorous. The number and the arrangement of the obstacles also change across time based on how well the policy can solve the current tasks. Given different target tasks, different sequences of tasks will be generated accordingly to form the suitable curricula. As a result, the policy can efficiently learn to solve the target task. In this example, the learned policy is able to first move away the target object to yield, uh, to yield the way for the obstacle, then remove the obstacles, and finally push the target object across the bridge towards the goal. More examples including pushing the target object across a bridge and inserting the target object into the slot. Compared to existing exploration and curriculum learning baselines, AppGen consistently achieves better performance with fewer training iterations and collected steps from the environment. While the variation of the generated tasks is determined by the parameterized task space, 
we demonstrate that AppGen can be also applied to target tasks that are outside of the predefined task space. This target task shown on the right shares the same state and action space with the parameterized task space, but the table has a different shape and a variety of household objects are placed on the table as environment constraints, which are not included in the parameterized task space. Although these new features cannot be generated by the procedural uh, generation module of limited capabilities, AppGen gradually learns to outline the scene of the target task by utilizing uh, the available elements uh, such as cuboids and empty holes. To summarize, we would like to have embodied interactive and diverse tasks that will catalyze AI in robotics. In the first part of this talk, Fefe introduced interactive Gibson environment, which aims to design large scale and realistic environments in simulation to enable human and robotic agents to perform interactive tasks. Then in the adaptive procedural task generation project, we design like an algorithm to automatically create tasks via procedural content generation, such that the agent can learn to solve hard exploration problems by generating tasks as curricula. Thank you.